I know. How did we lose that? And I, I call this what you're talking about being evidence enslaved instead of evidence informed. Yes. Right. So if we look at the evidence based information, it is true, but partial. And is if do I have time to give you a quick example of that? You have all the time in the world. <laughs> This is the Anthropology Podcast, the podcast where we optimize the bodies, brains, and lifestyles of entrepreneurs, go-getters, and world-changing innovators. Welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Megan Walker. As a naturopathic doctor and anthropologist, I optimize the health and performance of badass women working to change the world as entrepreneurs and go-getters. You know, people exactly like you. Your business, body, balance, and inner badass, these are the themes we are exploring. So my guest today, Andrea Nakayama, is someone I've been super excited to bring on the podcast. We met for the first time on the side of a mountain in Utah, and we'll talk about that story in the podcast today. But what I was so struck by when I first met her is not only her story and the resilience that she showed as a result of it, but the incredible business that she built on the other side. Andrea is the founder of the Functional Nutrition Alliance, and she has had over 3,500 practitioners move through her programs. Andrea is a nutritionist by background, but what makes her so effective as both a clinician and as a teacher for practitioners is her natural knack and ability to take complex, integrative ideas and bring them down and use language that makes them so simple for all of us to understand. She utilized those skills as we talked about some of the fundamentals of building building a scalable business and being an entrepreneur, and also how to assess which diet you should be picking up in this massive landscape of options that are available in front of us. It was a real pleasure to sit down with Andrea today, and it is a pleasure for me to be able to introduce her and welcome her to the podcast for all of you. Andrea Nakayama, welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. Thank you, Megan. I'm super excited to be here with you. I'm super excited because I feel like we started the conversation about doing a podcast episode, literally, it was sort of a surreal day, walking through a field during a solar eclipse on the side of a mountain in Utah. (laughs) Like it's true. People are sometimes like, where do you find your guests? And I was like, well, during an eclipse on the side of a mountain, where do you find your guests? Um, it's true. <laughs> right. But we had we had such a um a fascinating conversation and uh you shared with me your journey as an entrepreneur and as a mother and uh it was really profound and it really touched me deeply. And I'm wondering if that's where we could start, if you could really share with us your story. How did you get to this place where you are now, which is a deeply successful uh entrepreneur leading a mission led company to help people be um healthier through nutrition and helping nutritionists uh be better practitioners. But it is your story um, that I think fuels that passion and that success. And I think it's such an important part of the context. So can you share that with us? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. I often think of myself as an accidental entrepreneur because I didn't start out with that intention. It really is the mission that has driven my successes. And that mission stems back to a huge event in my own life. And I think that's true for most of us in healthcare and that uh, have an entrepreneurial pursuit. And that instance in my life was when my husband, Isamu, was diagnosed with a very grave, a grade four brain tumor. It's called a glioblastoma multiforme when I was just seven weeks pregnant. This is back in April of 2000, so some time ago. And I was already somebody who was passionate about food and cooking and the farmer's markets and my own body and health because it had taken me some time to get pregnant. So I was aware of diet and lifestyle, but this kicked me into a completely different gear. Isamu wasn't expected to live six months beyond his diagnosis, there was really nothing leading up to it that we would have known was going on in his body that was that grave. He was, you know, a 30-year-old 30, 30 man, very healthy, and uh, it was a big surprise for us, and the onset was very rapid. 
and he lived two and a half years. So he did live to see our son born and to have a good 19 months of imprinting on our child. But he was uh, my soulmate. And watching him treated like a dead man walking changed my perception of medicine. Of course, we had to hand ourselves over. We were so young. But at the same time, I realized how much more there was for us to do and how I was really inspired to change the way we do healthcare. And what to me is so profound about that is I think people come out of those events and they go, okay, I want, I want to be part of change. And then things settle back down and they go back to doing their thing. But that didn't happen for you. Like you picked up that, um, that next step and that next piece and you, you carried it and you built this really beautiful business. Can you share with us like what, what happened next? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. So this is, like I said, this was a long time ago. My son's 18 now. It's a, it's, we've had a long journey together, a beautiful one. And after Isamu died, in uh, July of 2002, I still was doing my old thing. I had a completely different career, but my life had obviously changed and I didn't let that change go away. I like to think of this as post-traumatic growth versus post-traumatic stress. So sure, over the years, I can uncover the ways in which the stress impacted my life, was likely a trigger for my own autoimmune condition. There's certainly stress that I went through, through that period and through the aftermath after he died and raising a child on my own. But I was also inspired. I had also seen the change in the way that we were able to keep him alive longer than anticipated, how healthy our baby was through the dietary changes that we made during that time that I was pregnant and how healthy I was. I actually uh, was in my skinny jeans two weeks post post uh, birth because I had changed my diet and my body had regulated in a way that was really fascinating to me. I was thinking, what's going on here? And we were eating so healthy and I was eating so much, but I was eating in a different way. So I was very inspired by all that had happened. And I kept our dietary lifestyle. So that almost became our religion. It became what we lived by. We eat a whole foods diet. We eat healthy foods. Um, I became the person who showed up at the potlucks bringing the healthy, really yummy foods. Didn't taste like cardboard or tree bark. And I started to sh continue to show up like that even when I decided to make this leap and make a huge career change. So the obstacles were there. I was now a single mom. I was the only breadwinner in the family. And I had to make a big leap and make some decisions to put myself back through school to make sure that my parents were okay with that. I don't know why. As Yeah, why do we do that? I know, right? But I kind of felt like I needed their blessing. I was about to, as a single mom, leave a very successful career in book publishing and start all over. And I had been quietly preparing for that financially, but I had to take a leap. There was a lot of crossover. Sometimes I started, um, some of the schoolwork I did was at night while I was working during the day. I just felt so driven to do this, that it, it was worth the sacrifice. I think of everything we do in the realm of risk reward, even when it has to do with the decisions we make around diet and lifestyle. And the risk of not doing this was too big for me. Yeah. And I love that. And I talk to my patients a lot about this idea of purpose. The most important thing that I think they can have in place with respect to their health, this is my opinion, is is a clear sense or a journey towards understanding what their purpose is all about. And I, I love that that is something that you embody in such an authentic way. Mm, thank you. And I, I couldn't agree more. For me, even the realm of functional nutrition or functional medicine, it's how we get this vessel that we're living in clear and clean and working, functioning to its best ability so that those messages can come through. 
when we're in pain, when there's a lot of discord, when we're caught up in our story, it's hard to feel that calling, if we want to call it that. And it did to me feel like a calling. It felt like I didn't have a choice. This is the purpose I was here for. This is what I was meant to do. And it doesn't come without struggle or sacrifice. Yeah, it's not meant to be easy. I hear a lot of people say this, that they're like, oh, I know I'm on the right track when it's all easy and this perfect flow state. And I was like, oh, I I think you're going to miss the opportunity to live your purpose then because it it isn't necessarily how these things get dropped on our lap. It's not because everything is just beautiful and blissful and then our purpose comes wrapped up on our front porch one day. Yeah, it's it's actually there's not one day. That's easy, right? There is ease and there is joy. And the joy really does feed that forward momentum. But I would say there's not been one day where it's easy. Every point of growth comes with its challenges. And and I've had students, my students say this, like, oh, you don't understand. I have to put myself out in front of people and that feels vulnerable for me. You don't feel that anymore. And I'm always saying, Every single place along the journey comes with its own vulnerability. You might not, you might feel vulnerable going to the co op and ta- having a talk there. I feel vulnerable going on stage in front of 3,000 people. It doesn't, it's the same vulnerability and it follows you every time. Yes, you learn skills to deal with it, but each point forward puts you at that place that isn't quote unquote easy, but is an opportunity. Absolutely. One of my associates in my uh, in my practice, I asked him how he got to where he is at in his career. And he's like, oh, every time I was at a junction in my career, when I would look around and see the next thing that looked like the biggest, hardest, um, scariest challenge, I would just go for that. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like, how refreshing is that? It wasn't, I just, I exactly. tried to find the easiest next step. He's like, I just found the next mountain. Um, exactly. And, uh, and I feel like that's such a commonality. Like if we start to break down, you know, what is it that builds towards um, someone's success? Uh, I feel like this is one of those common threads that I, that I hear from people. Yeah. And I do think that purpose that you were talking about, Megan, does when it's outside of ourselves, when it's bigger than us, it does enable us. It gives us the kind of power or incentive to climb that mountain, right? If we make it all about us, if we get stuck in our story, then we can come up with a million excuses why to not do it. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, and I had this realization, I used to run this youth organization and we would do big conferences. And, and my husband asked me one day, he's like, I was, I was freaking out about some element of our live event. And he's like, you used to do these for hundreds of people and you'd pull big sponsors. And, and I was like, I know, but I was, I was doing it for the kids. And I, and I had this realization. I was like, ah, like even this event, this event isn't about me. This is about how it's going to impact all these practitioners and then the ripple effect on their patients. And as soon as I tied it to, okay, we are going to be able to impact this massive number of people. Then, then like it was a, it was a bravery and confidence and ease, not easy ease that, uh, that I hadn't previously, uh, previously tapped into. So I just, I agree with you so much. Like you get it and make it bigger than you and the universe responds. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that comes true in our health too. It's about business. It's about entrepreneurship, but I think it's also about the decisions we make regarding our health. How do we get out of our own way? Absolutely. And I know that's a huge part of the philosophy of the Functional Nutrition Alliance. So tell us a little bit more about your actual business. And then I want to understand a little bit more about the psychology of health and nutrition that you bring to the table, because I know that's a huge part of what you do. Yeah, thanks for um, allowing me to speak into that. I do feel very passionate about it. So the Functional Nutrition Alliance has different arms. We serve the patient uh, directly. We have a clinic, and that to me is very important. It's where I started And it really is our research and development. We continue to work and learn from the hands-on work that we're doing. And by hands-on, it's all virtual. So we work with people all over the world, but we apply our methodologies in our clinic. And I have a team of nutritionists that is dedicated to that work. 
the place where I spend most of my time, though I am the clinical director, so I'm meeting with my team all the time, reviewing labs, really bringing sh- the, the thinking forward to the work we do. But the majority of my time is spent in our school functional nutrition lab, which I have created over a decade now, almost a decade, of teaching other clinicians in the art and science of the functional nutrition practice. And we have um, over 3,500 graduates in 63 countries that are learning this methodology and putting it to practice, no matter their scope of practice. So we have everyone from health coaches and what I like to call health advocates, you know, somebody who may be able to work as an educator in their community, a specified community, let's say they're a breast cancer survivor that really transformed their own life through nutrition and diet and lifestyle modification through their own experience and wants to educate their community. That's a, you know, what I would call a health advocate to medical doctors who are saying, I didn't learn any nutrition in medical school. um, And I didn't learn enough about how to practice it. I'm realizing that nutrition isn't a handout that I give out that tells people how to change their diet because it's a lot more complicated than that. So that's a functional nutrition lab. And that is, again, a virtual school. It's a virtual um, platform. And I'm still teaching there every week and uh, really accelerating the careers of people who want to embrace the truths of diet and lifestyle modification through a unique bio-individual perspective. I want to I want to talk about the bio individual perspective, but I first just want to shout out 3,500 practitioners, Andrea. That's amazing. I know it's growing fast. It is growing fast. We are um, we are getting people the tools that they need to really be able to do this work. A lot of people are floundering because there's so much information out there these days about diet, about dietary theories, and people get stuck in these theories, and then they get into practice, and it doesn't work. And this is true of the educated consumer as well. We learn so much, and we think, oh, I'll take that supplement. Oh, I'll do that diet. Sure, bone broth, keto, you know, intermittent fasting. And when it doesn't work for us, we feel like a failure. And functional nutrition is about honoring the entirety of the individual so we can see what works at what time. I like to think of the journey as heal versus ideal. And a lot of what's out there is ideal. It works for 80% of the people. But I'm really committed to addressing the needs of the 20% that is not succeeding with the theories that are out there. Yeah, well, and I want to talk about this concept of bio individuality. And um, it's funny that you mentioned this, because even nutritionists get confused by all of it. And I agree, I I treat a lot of nutritionists in my practice. And we always kind of we get to a point where we're smiling about it. But I was like, they're on everything all at once, right? Because we go to a conference this weekend, we're like, Oh, I'm gonna be on like all the all the keto stuff. And then they go to a conference the next week, and it's plant based. And like, Oh, well, I need all those antioxidants. So they're on like hundreds of supplements. They're like, I'm doing all the stuff. I'm like, it's true, you're doing all the stuff at once. Um, And for for even us as practitioners, like we need some, it's like a coach, you need someone else to coach you. Um, But let's talk about this concept of bioindividuality, because I think there's a lot of people out there breathing the sigh of relief. And they're like, you mean, I don't have to be doing keto because it's 2019. (laughs) And, and I always find this so ironic that in the health space, we have these black and white debates. So you're either pro or against vaccination and you have to pick one or you're plant based or you're um, or you're paleo. You you have to pick one like we, we are very dogmatic. And I think very even it's just it's not human nature that we want to put ourselves in boxes. So the notion of bio individuality just sort of melts those boundaries away. And I would love for you to address that for people, because I think people are are, are breathing a bit of a sigh of relief, as I said, that that maybe their instinct is correct. They don't need to be in a dietary box. They need to understand what it takes to find the thing that's right for them. Right. And that is a journey. And I like to think of everything we do as a yes and. Like, yes, those are good theories. And what's true for me? Or what I call true, but partial. That theory or that information is true, but there's a little bit of a hole in it. And that means we need a process of discovery 
And I think that's what's missing. In addition to what you're talking about, about the polarities that we engage in with what's right and wrong, I think we do that with medicine as well. We think we put our hands on our hips and we say, well, medicine is doing it all wrong and we should use food as medicine. And I don't come from that approach. I really do think there is a place and a way in which we need medicine. And there's a place that we need to understand where it has its purpose. I spent all day yesterday with my son getting surgery for his deviated septum. Like I said, he's 18. I kind of wonder if his the development of his septum got impaired during the time when he was in utero when I was going through the biggest stressor of finding out this diagnosis, right? And we've done everything diet and lifestyle to help his respiratory breathing and his gut and, you know, no food sensitivities, and he's managed. But his septum was severely deviated, and he's always sneezing and always has allergies. So yes, and how do we understand how to support him through surgery, through diet and lifestyle and post-surgery, but he needed the surgery and now was the time. So I just want to position that as a polarity that we get into as well. But I've developed theories and, and tools into which we can start to understand who is this individual. And when I say the art of the practice, so the science and the art of the functional nutrition practice, for me, art stands for assess, recommend, and track. And we're constantly in this loop of assessing, making recommendations, and tracking. Depending on our scope, we're not diagnosing, we're not prescribing, but we are assessing. And the assessment tools need to give us the information to make the right recommendations for the individual which is where bioindividuality comes in. And this is where we use the functional nutrition matrix. We use a number of tracking tools. Tracking, again, is circular in that it becomes more of our assessment so that we can make the next recommendations, right? But I like to break that down into what I call the patient's story, their soup, and their skill. So the story is in functional medicine, what we call the ATMs, the antecedents, triggers, and mediators. We kind of spend a lot of time there in functional nutrition, blowing that up, understanding who are you that is coming to the table with the signs, the symptoms, or the diagnoses that you're presenting with. The soup is the internal physiology. Instead of looking at evidence-based practices based on a nutraceutical or a pharmaceutical, we're actually looking at physiology as evidence. We're saying, how should the body function and where is it awry? What do those signs, symptoms, and diagnoses tell us about what's not coming in clear here? If you think about it like a, uh, a dial on a radio, if something's, if the body's not functioning right, it's, it may be just a little off tune. I'm not talking about a pathology where somebody's in the hospital. I'm talking about the fuzziness of the dial. And the skill is what are we doing to address those needs, the story and the soup of the individual? A lot of people are putting skill into action, like those nutritionists you spoke about in your practice. They're putting skill into action without understanding the story or the soup. And this is what I call, um, you know, the epigenetics of the online telesummit. We're actually changing our terrain, possibly negatively, when we're putting things into action that aren't right for our own body. Thank you. Like, thank you for saying that, because yeah. um, that's, that's the truth, right? I had this uh, heated debate with someone's primary care provider, and I have a relationship with this individual, so we 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 do this. Um, but he had put someone on a proton pump inhibitor, and I was like, "Can we can we address the 
the root cause of the problem. And his whole thing with me was like, well, produce the study for me that shows that X, Y, or Z diet needs to be in place for this person to benefit. And I was like, but just step back and use like the science training that you received in your undergraduate degree and think about how this tissue works physiologically. Like there is no harm to be done by taking out the junk food and the dairy and the alcohol for three weeks. And then reassessing, like, I love this notion that physiology is the evidence and giving that some weight in the conversation. I know. How did we lose that? And I I call this what you're talking about being evidence enslaved instead of evidence informed, right? So if we look at the evidence-based information, it is true, but partial. And is if, do I have time to give you a quick example of that? You have all the time in the world. <laughs> okay. So I did my capstone thesis in nutrition school on the connection between um, multiple sclerosis and candida overgrowth. And what we can say there through the evidence that's available is that there's no causative relationship. If you have candida, you're not going to get MS. If you have MS, you don't necessarily have candida. So it's not causative, which means that a a doctor who's mired in evidence-based approaches will not factor in the truth about candida in those who have MS. If you look at it through a correlative lens, which allows us to think about it through physiological um, underpinnings, we do know through evidence-based practices, that there is dysbiosis in the guts of those who have autoimmunity. It's one of the three pillars that we look at through, um, through a, you know, a corrective lens, a lens that is making recommendations for those who have autoimmunity. So there is going to be gut dysbiosis or some sort of infection. And we do know that when there is gut dysbiosis, there is a higher likelihood of candida overgrowth. So from a corrective lens, from making recommendations, if we deal with or start looking at the microbiota and the gut uh, diversity and start to think of it through the lens of looking at any potential overgrowths or infections, including candida, we do start to lead to remedy. And I've used this approach for numerous autoimmune clients and found good results. So again, it's not causative, which is what evidence-based practices are looking for. I can't treat that if the science doesn't make that causative relationship. But if we do look at things through a correlative lens, we start to see differences. And I like to think of this in root cause medicine as the terrain versus the roots. The roots matter but those roots grow in a terrain. And that terrain is where diet and lifestyle modification really matter. We address the terrain, the roots start to get healthier. It's the soil. Were you always a teacher? Uh, you know, I didn't think I was. <laughs> but you I come are. from a teachers. And, <laughs> and then I somehow have learned over the years that yes, I, I guess I am a teacher. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, these are tough concepts. Right. Like, yes, like really the, what happens in medicine is that we've got all these ologists, we've got endocrinologists and dermatologists and oncologists and all of these people. And and so much of that was created because it's just way easier to organize when everyone lives in a tight little box. But the reality is that's just isn't how a living physiological being is. It's a hot Correct. mess. There's no yes. there's no delineation and the body doesn't care what your area of specialty is and it's going to cross boundaries and it's going to impact other systems. And so what's happened is we've created a system to deal with one's physiology that isn't actually congruent with how a body actually works. And that seems to be where it all breaks down is it's this inconvenient reality that the body's way more complex than the box that we've tried to put it in. Yes, it's that soup that I'm talking about. That soup is that like melting pot of all the uh, biological systems and how they interrelate. You can't take the gut away from the hormones. You can't take inflammation away from structural integrity. You can't. They're all interrelated. Right. Right. And it's not that either one of us are saying your doctor is wrong. 
No. But I think the opportunity and evolution for people listening in their own health is to start to um, acknowledge for themselves that probably their instinct with respect to how their, their health is is unfolding for them is more complex than they have previously been told. But it's also a platform upon which you can have a conversation with your own medical team, where you're really questioning, not in an anti-authority sort of way, but in a general curiosity manner, how what's going on in your body or the medication you've been on for 20 years is possibly impacting other sy sim uh, symptoms and systems. But conversely, what could you be doing in your lifestyle to actually address uh, the core problem? And is there power we can hand back to the patient? And so when you approach people with respect to their health, and we're talking about the root and the foundation of their health, where do you start? Like nutrition is your passion, but with under that umbrella, what's, th what's the first thing you do with people? Yeah, I mean, there's two ways I can look at that. From one perspective, I would say, if you're not sleeping, you're not pooping, your blood sugar is out of balance, you, you can't go much further. Like you have to get those things in place, because they impact so many systems in the body. But in our teaching and in our clinic, we call this the three tiers to nutrition mastery. And tier one is what we call the non negotiables. Tier two is deficiency to sufficiency, and tier three is dismantling the dysfunction. And what you are speaking to, Megan, that a lot of doctors are doing in their respective ologies is doing tier three work. They're dismantling the dysfunction before the system is ready to dismantle it. So we see a lot of people even seeing the top functional medicine doctors around the world but what the doctors are doing is too fast for the individual system or too much at once, like you were talking about earlier. And we have to slow down and prepare the body for that intervention, which is an insult of its own to the system. So tier one, those non-negotiables and tier two, deficiency to sufficiency, don't need to be linear. They can be interactive. But our non-negotiables are where we take ownership of our own health. And all of you listening, you probably know some of your non-negotiables. And I don't mean your shoulds. I don't mean I should do this. I mean, the things that you know, I always feel better when I go to sleep by 1030. I'm having a hard time doing that. But, you know, that is a reality for me. How do you make that a non-negotiable for yourself? Again, it goes back to the risk reward we were talking about with the entrepreneurship earlier. So these non-negotiables are vast and they're not just about what you eat and how you live your life. They're everything. What kind of relationships do you want to be in? Where do you have joy in your life? What are your non-negotiables. If you're somebody who has is used to having a lot of fun and enjoys going out and now you have two small children and you can never go anywhere and everything's business and money and work, where do you find those moments of joy? Because that is part of your healing. And deficiencies, they could be that hydrochloric acid that you're talking about with the individual that was put on a PPI. They could be deficiencies in love or community or relationship, or vitamin D, or your like uh, cortisol, you know, deficiencies are vast. So we open up our thinking to where are there non negotiables in my life? And how do I own those for myself? That's not something my doctor can tell me. It's something I have to start to identify with myself, or with a practitioner who's going to go there with me, which is what I train practitioners to do. What are your non-negotiables? My non-negotiables are sleep, definitely. They are the way I eat and the quality that I eat. They are um, feeling joy and inspiration in my life. Their acceptance of who I am. Um, you know, I tend to be a kind of serious person and recognizing like, mm, that's who I am. I don't need a lot of uh, typical forms of play. So acceptance, love, recognition of who I am, but also how I eat, what I eat, who I spend time with, how I continue to be devoted to um, 
a life that's committed to growth and transformation. Hey, fellow go-getters. So we've got a lot going on right now over at Anthropology Performance Labs, and I want to make sure that you guys are in the loop. We have groups and contests and quizzes and meal plans and all sorts of things that you can get your hands on. And the best place for you to be in the know is actually to ensure that you are following and hanging out and engaging over on the gram. My personal handle, which is at doctor, that is D-R Megan Walker, is where most of this activity is currently taking place. And so I'm going to invite all of you to come on over and to follow and to play along. This way you can engage with our weekly guests, get direct links to some of the things that they're talking about in our show notes, and have access to some of the coolest new quizzes, ideas, and games and links that we have in the pipeline over at Anthropology. Head on over to Instagram, hit follow, and let's keep in touch. My handle over there is at Dr. Megan Walker, and let's keep the conversation happening. Amazing. And I think this is such a a poignant and beautiful place to transition to uh, the second half of uh, our interview. And I call these our KPIs, or key performance indicators. So just like we have them in our business, I believe that we have them uh, in our life as well. So if you'll indulge me, I've got some I've got some questions for you in a rapid fire kind of manner. First question, how do you define health? Hmm. I define health as a sense of peace and well-being that I am on my path. Amazing. Who's inspiring you right now? That one takes a a little bit of thinking. Um, I have such weird, vast sources of inspiration. This conversation is inspiring me right now. The people who, who are on my team inspire me right now. They're so devoted and work so hard and constantly challenging themselves and challenging me. The students in our community inspire me. They ask great questions. They're out there trying to do the work. So I find inspiration in my kid and my lover in you, Megan. I think it's all around us. So lovely. What is the one thing you're most consistent with, with respect to your health? Um, I'm a pretty darn consistent person. I do commit to my bedtime 10 to 1030. It's rare that I don't (laughs) adhere to that. And I'm very consistent with my diet, uh, which does not include any processed foods, of course, but no gluten, dairy, refined sugar. That's, those are non-negotiables. I don't even think about it anymore. They're just there. What is something totally badass about you that people would not otherwise know? I think I'm a badass, Megan. I think (laughs) think you are too. (laughs) In my own little way, or maybe not so little, um, I truly believe that we can change the way we do healthcare. I study leadership and am committed to being a voice for a a population that is ready to get out there and to inspire and inform them to do the work that they want to do. And leadership isn't about me. It's about the movement. And um, I'm going to be a badass and get out there and continue to do this work and push at the boundaries and push for recognition. It's, It's not for me about disrupting the system. It's about informing and inspiring within the system um, while pushing at the boundaries. What do you do for fun or play? I love to uh, get out there in the woods um, and go hiking. And um, I'm eager to get out in the snow and go snowshoeing. I'm planning a big hiking trip for the fall to in Europe. So I love to be out in nature. I love to laugh and be silly, even from my serious perspective. Walking in Utah during um, an eclipse, that's pretty darn fun. It was pretty darn fun. What's your favorite color? (laughs) Um, Probably orange, reddish orange. Oh, I like that. Orange is a rare, is rare answer. 
I know. And finally, entrepreneurism. Are we born this way or do we learn to become entrepreneurs? Hmm. Ah, it's like I, we started, I think I said I'm an accidental. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there may be a little bit of both. I think that things can happen in life that inspire us to get out there and make a change. So I think there are some that are just born that way. And there are some of us that are so inspired that we learn to get out of our own way and make that happen. Amazing. Andrea, I know people are going to want to follow up with you. Where's the best place to send them to learn a little bit more about what you're up to? Well, Megan, I know we have some practitioners here. There's a lot of very informed, high-level patients. I I consider myself among them, one of those people as well. So our website, the general website, fxnutrition.com, can direct you where you're looking to go to get more information with um, various Uh, opportunities to get the three tiers to nutrition mastery and all those different assets. So fxnutrition.com is our hub for all that we do. Andrea, you are just full of knowledge and fire and I thoroughly enjoyed this. Thank you so much for hanging out today. It was so much fun. This was fun. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, my absolute pleasure. If you enjoyed our conversation and would like to hear more, head on over to Stitcher or iTunes and subscribe to the Anthropology Podcast. We would also really appreciate a quick review. When people have their health, they can change the world. Let us keep you healthy and you go change the world.